About five years ago, me and my husband went to a couple's holiday to Paris with a few friends of ours. I was awfully excited about the whole thing. A friend of mine had invited us to join her and her husband and some of the links she sent me were just gorgeous. She'd booked a two-bedroom Airbnb in this place called Palaisu, a quaint little French village about 15 minutes drive from Paris, which meant we could soak up a bit of French country living in between a full day's shopping and dining in Paris itself. It seemed like it would be a dream weekend break for me. I mean, there's no place more romantic than Paris, right? So, we get the Eurostar over to Paris, have a bit of lunch there, pick up a rental car, then drive out to the Airbnb. I was just buzzing. I'd be practicing the little bit of French I'd learn in school, and although I was a bit terrible, the French people were so nice about it. I'd heard that they'd be really rude, and it was just lovely how that turned out to be just a myth. Lunch was lovely, and the house was just gorgeous. Me and a friend had a nice catch-up while we explored the house, and we let the boys be boys for a little while, fawning over how adorably French everything was. The back garden was amazing too, this big green lawn that just opened up into a dense patch of woodland at the end. I was in heaven. It was still a bit chilly out, but the place was just serene, and it really was so romantic. I had no idea that our little bubble of romantic bliss was about to be so horribly ruined. We had this really lovely dinner in a little local brasserie, then wandered back to the Airbnb in the dark, admittedly a little drunk. Grateful to be back in the warmth, we carry on drinking in the Airbnb's kitchen for a while, and my friend's boyfriend is messing around and exploring all the cupboards and drawers in the kitchen. This is how he finds a flashlight. Quite a cheap one from what I could tell, but it prompted him to want to explore the dark woods at the end of the garden. We were all just joking about how he'd obviously be the first one to die in a horror movie, but unfazed and a bit tipsy, he goes out nonetheless to explore the end of the garden. He's out there for about 10 minutes and meanwhile we're all just chatting away, planning our little day trip into Paris the following morning and we just hear this scream. We all go quiet, realizing it's my friend's boyfriend who just screamed at the top of his lungs. He then comes running into the back door and starts asking, Who speaks the best French? Because we need to call the police right now. My boyfriend accused him of trying to pull a prank at first, but... You could just tell he was genuinely scared and he honestly went white as a sheet. He's like, I swear on my mom's life, this is not a joke, we need to call the police. A bit of panic ensues before he finally blurts out that we're not in any obvious danger but we still need to get the police out to us because there's an actual dead body in the woods at the back of the house. Our jaws are on the floor at this point and my boyfriend was still in such a state of disbelief that he demanded to go out and see it for himself. My friend's boyfriend, who was the one who found the body, starts saying, You don't want to do that, man. Honestly. She's not in a good way. The reason he was so freaked out is that it wasn't just a dead body, some poor elderly person that had fallen over and hit in their head or something. The guy said it was really obvious that this person had been killed. Like they were a mess. We got the police out and thankfully one of them spoke really good English so my friend's boyfriend could tell them how we found the body. While that's going down, the rest of us are just looking for somewhere else to stay for the night, settling on a four-star hotel in central Paris. The entire trip was ruined. We thought we could just duck out and enjoy the rest of the weekend but the police wanted to talk to us the next day too. Apparently if it wasn't for the obvious foul play, we'd have been free to leave. But basically, we'd wanted a romantic weekend away and ended up sort of being suspects in this random French person's murder. Obviously, we were finally cleared and we were able to travel back home, but the whole thing was just terribly horrifying. Weirdest thing was is that the owners asked us for good reviews afterwards, even though we found a dead body on their property. Of all the surreal, insane aspects of that trip... That took the cake. My family loves Christmas. We're some of the most annoying people that start putting up the Christmas decorations in mid-November. And playing Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You 
for the first time every year has become a bit of a ritual. My husband and my three daughters always wear their matching pajamas, which I love, and although cooking Christmas dinner can be a bit stressful some years, I just adore being that family that all the relatives flock to when the festive season comes around. There's only one big problem. We're Australian. Time for a quick explanation. In America and Europe, Christmas takes place during the winter, obviously, but the months surrounding December are some of the hottest in the Aussie calendar. Down under, you're more likely to be sunbathing with your Santa hat on than sipping warm eggnog by a log fire. But just like everywhere else, pretty much all of our festive imagery consists of snow-covered winter wonderlands, fields caked in snow, and little robins red-breasted nestled in the bough of a pine tree. But where we live, in a place called Darwin, it's a lot more palm tree than pine tree. Like my two kids have never even seen snow and in 2019, we wanted to change that. So even though people called us crazy for doing it, we booked flights over to a freezing cold Europe in late November. The whole trip was absolutely amazing. I found the flights to be a bit of a pain, but seeing some of Europe's most incredible sights, given a festive twist by a dusting of snow, it was worth every minute of being stuck in that cramped demon tube. We saw Prague, Berlin, Rome, Copenhagen, Paris, and London. But what my family seemed to be looking forward to the most was seeing Ireland for the first time. The kids seemed to have it in their heads that it was some magical place full of fairies and such, and could barely contain their excitement. While the prospect of drinking Guinness straight from the tap had my husband almost as giddy as our two little girls. We arrived at this little Airbnb out in the suburbs of Cork, a semi-detached rental that looked like something out of a storybook, and before anyone even puts their bags down, they're clamoring for the Wi-Fi password. Now, my husband works in IT and internet safety is something of a passion of his, not just because it's his occupation, but because he know to help keep our daughters safe from some of the darker things that are out there in cyberspace. You'd have to ask him for all the details regarding the thing he does, but whenever we arrived at an Airbnb somewhere, my husband would like to scan the network to make sure it had parental locks and was otherwise secure. So, he's tapping away on his laptop as I'm having a quick cup of coffee when I notice this particular look on his face, one I'd come to recognize as meaning, I don't like this at all. I take a seat next to him on the couch, leaning over to take a look at what's bothering him. All I can see is computer nonsense on the screen. I've never been very tech savvy, so much to my chagrin, I have to ask him to explain to me. He points to this line of text and explains that it told him that there was already a device connected to the Wi-Fi network when we arrived. He shows how he could account for all our phones and his laptop being connected, but there was one mystery device somewhere. Then he opens up another window and points towards a little icon, one that was clearly a little picture of a camera. Me being me, I try and see the positive side, suggesting that it's a security camera installed on the exterior of the property, but my husband does a lap of the building and says he couldn't see any kind of device anywhere. It's at that point that he starts trying to work some of his IT magic, and a few minutes later, I hear him calling me back into the kitchen in one of those dad voices like, something is wrong, but... I can't tip off the kids. His eyes are all wide as he points towards his laptop screen again and on it is a video feed of the bedroom our girls were planning on staying in, like a top-down view as if the camera were on the ceiling. We just go running up to the girls' room to find that the camera had been hidden inside a smoke detector that was directly over one of the beds. We still don't quite know who, but someone had been planning on watching our daughter sleep, which is just about one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me and the family. My husband calls over the owner of the property right away to ask him why there was a camera installed in one of the kids' bedrooms. At first, the owner denied having CCTV on the property in the first place and had the nerve to suggest that the video feed was coming from another property in the area, as if I wouldn't recognize my own bloody children. My husband had to actually threaten to send them a screenshot of the video feed to get them to admit it and then they came out with a load of garbage about simply wanting to protect their assets. 
My husband then accused the person of being a voyeur and that he'd be reporting them to Airbnb, at which point they got all tongue-tied and couldn't think of anything to say. And then they just hung up. We called them out on being a creep and they didn't have a word to say in their own defense. We were absolutely furious and thoroughly creeped out, having only narrowly avoided having that absolute dog staring at our kids all night. And even though it was quite late in the evening at that point, me and my husband got the kids to pack their things while we looked for a hotel nearby. It took us a good few months of emailing back and forth with Airbnb's customer complaints department, but we eventually got the refund we were most definitely entitled to. Airbnb also reassured us that they'd banned the homeowner from renting properties using the service, which did far more for my peace of mind than any amount of cash would have. I know there are people out there with those kinds of twisted desires and stuff, but never for a second did I ever think I'd run into one myself, let alone on our dream Christmas vacation over to Europe. The only thing that really worries me now is Airbnb's ability to keep this person and people like him off their platform altogether. My husband and I have pressed them on the systems they have in place to ensure their customer's safety, but they simply don't have any satisfactory answers. We made the point that this horrible voyeur could easily set up an account in the name of a friend or relative and simply continue recording people's kids against their knowledge, and the legalese email we received in response basically said, we have no idea what to do about it. And that's the fear I'm left with, that somewhere out there is a little girl, lying peacefully in her bed, who has no idea that some Irish creep is watching them, doing God knows what while he does so. Me and a close friend of mine decided to get an Airbnb in New York for a week's worth of birthday celebrations one year, and we were both really excited about the whole thing. The listing my friend had managed to find us consisted of the two top floors of an old townhouse, and it looked absolutely stunning. I think people are so focused on the sleek skyscrapers and other modern amenities that we associate with NYC that we forget how old it is too, and how a lot of that history is written into the architecture of some of the city's oldest buildings. So, we catch a flight over, arrive at the Airbnb, and it's everything we could have wished for. Even better, the owner lived on the ground floor of the building, so if we needed anything, he was just downstairs. Brilliant, right? Nope wrong. Like most things, you don't really know what you're dealing with until you're actually rubbing noses with it. The guy's checking us in, asking if we have any questions or anything and otherwise being perfectly welcoming. Then all of a sudden, just as we're saying thanks and all that, he's like, oh, girls, by the way, there should be a large duffel under one of your beds. Under no circumstances are you to touch it. A little awkward silence follows where me and my friend are kind of like, WTF? And then we ask him if he doesn't want us to, you know, grab the bag before we settle in, since it's obviously something quite private. He then responds with, No, that's where it lives. Where it lives? What the actual F is that even supposed to mean? What is it, anyway? It sounds stupid now, but we just sort of laughed it off. We were in New York after all, in a city where everyone was a little bit crazy, we thought. Why let a little bit of kookiness ruin what would otherwise be an amazing birthday week, I thought. So, first night, I did actually take a peek under the bed and discovered that it was actually my bed that had the bag sitting under it. Lucky me. It looked perfectly clean. No weird smells coming from it, so no dead body. Winning, I thought. It didn't seem particularly stuffed with anything, but there were definitely things in it. Nothing that jingled or ticked like one of those old cartoon clock bombs, so whatever was in there couldn't be all that bad. And besides, it wasn't any of my business. Second night, and I'm a little bit more curious, but still, I can control myself and I just leave the bag be. Third day, me and my friend actually talk about it a little bit trying to imagine what it could be in there. I mean, there was no way he really and truly didn't want us to look in the bag, or he'd have taken it out of there before we ever checked in, right? But the question remained, 
What exactly was in that that he either did or didn't want us seeing? I started feeling really uncomfortable about the whole thing, especially since it was under my bed and not hers. My friend can read this in me easy peasy and start saying stuff that it's all the fella's murder weapons and that I'm going to be his next victim. Maybe that had gotten a response in the past, but under those circumstances, not funny in the least bit. And as you might have guessed, by the third night, the horrible curiosity had been gnawing away at my gut and getting the better of me. I'm lying there in bed, totally unable to sleep, and I can hear my friend snoring from the other room. Not that the walls were thin or anything, she just snores that loud. All I'm thinking is, I can take one look, one little peek, and the guy's never going to know, is he? I don't bother to wake my friend up. I'm just thinking, in and out, pretend it never happened, job done. So I slip off the bed as quietly as I can, reach for the bag. I'm honestly like a ninja with how quiet I'm being, like pulling the zipper open super slowly so it doesn't make any noise, and the whole time the tension is rising for me like, God, what's in the bag? When I finally saw, I had to bite my fist to stop from laughing. The first thing I see when I look into the bag are toys. Toys of an adult nature. And that's all we'll say about that. I think it was just the break in the mood for me. Worrying it was the mummified corpse of his mother or something when it was just a rubber knob. But looking back on it, even that was super creepy. But the thing that actually made me wake up my friend to be like, I think we need to get out of here, were the clothes that I found in the duffel. I'll be honest, my curiosity got the better of me and in for a penny, in for a pound as they say. I shouldn't have just started going through this guy's stuff, but oh my god, am I so glad I did. Because aside from the toys was stuff that actually made the hairs in the back of my neck stand on end. Pacifier, adult diapers, oversized adult pajamas with a colorful childish pattern on them. There was a lot of other stuff too, but lots of it was honestly too upsetting and messed up for me to want to write about. Thinking about what this fella got off to knocked me sick. Look, I'm not one to king shame or anything, but I think we can agree that that kind of stuff is just wrong. Weird at the very least. So there I am. It's about half past one in the morning and I'm wide awake with my mind going a mile a minute. The thing that swung it in the end for me was the fact that he brought the bag up in conversation to us. It's not like I was just being nosy and happened to be going through his stuff. No, like my friend said, if he really didn't want us to go through it, he wouldn't have mentioned it and he wouldn't have stashed the thing in one of the rooms we'd be staying in. I just didn't feel safe there anymore and I knew my friend wouldn't either once she knew what was in the bag. Cut to an hour later and we packed up all of our stuff, again being as quiet as possible. The plan was just to leave the keys on the kitchen table, sneak out and then just explain the situation to Airbnb and hope for a refund. We could just get out of there, clean break, never have to see him again. But that would have been way too easy, wouldn't it? Because right as we start carrying our heavy bags downstairs, we make way too much noise. I remember how hearing the bolt on his front door working just made my blood run cold. But we were trapped on the stairs. We couldn't leg it. We just had to walk past him trying not to make eye contact. Leaving early, are you? He said to us. I just had to grit my teeth and nod. Then he said, You looked in the bag, didn't you? As soon as the words left his lips... I had to make eye contact with him. Something about how brazen he was about it. How he just knew what was going on. It was so freaky. I think he must have read it in my face too, like the shock of how hard what he'd said hit home. He knew I had. He knew I hadn't been able to help myself. And he just smiled. This smug, sickening grin just stretched across his face and... He didn't say another word to us as he filed out of the apartment building and started off down the sidewalk. The whole thing actually ruined our trip for a couple of days. It was all we could talk about, all we could think about, and even when we just tried to forget about it and enjoy ourselves, it followed us around like a dark cloud. 
It wasn't until we got in touch with the police and told them what I'd found that we were able to regain any peace of mind. Obviously, the police couldn't do anything about it. Owning stuff like that wasn't a crime, no matter how perverse. Like he didn't have any pictures if you catch my drift, so all they could do was recommend that we take it up with Airbnb. I do still worry about it though, and I really hope he hasn't hurt anyone. We got him kicked off Airbnb after he wrote a really rude review about us. I emailed a member of the customer service team back and forth and explained exactly what had happened. So, there was some small silver lining. It's the only time it happened too. All the other hosts we've dealt with on Airbnb have been fantastic. But that being said, it only takes one bad experience to really paint your opinion of something, doesn't it? There was a point a couple of years back where I decided that discovering Airbnb was the best thing that ever happened to me. And the weirdest thing was that the whole thing had blossomed from one of the worst things to ever happen to me. I've known friends and colleagues that have lost a parent and just sort of took it on the chin. Their death came in an advanced age or after a long illness. It was something they could accept. But when I lost my dad out of the blue in 2017, it hit me really hard. He was fit and healthy, a really careful sort of bloke, and I doubt anyone could say the same for the drunk driver that plowed into him that Thursday evening. The only thing that was supposed to cushion the blow were the savings and life insurance payouts that the family got. I mean, it was a lot of money. Dad must have been squirreling it away for years, enough to pay for my little sister to go traveling for what turned out to be a heck of a long time. But I didn't want the money. I just wanted Dad back. I had to wait for the grief to subside before I could decide what to do with it and instead of just splurging it away, I decided to make an investment. It was around that time that a friend mentioned Airbnb and how an uncle of hers was making a killing from renting out a flat they owned in the city center. It was a bit daunting spending that amount of money, but I took the plunge. Then after refurbishing the flat and posting an advert on Airbnb, I had my first booking within a week. The income was unreal. Within six months, I'd made half the money back, so I invested in another place. A year in, I was flush with cash and even though I kept my full-time job, it got to the point where I didn't actually have to work anymore. Cue fancy holidays, a huge car upgrade, life was good. Then, boom, COVID hits and my Airbnb income completely dried up. Remember when we all thought COVID would be over in a few weeks or months? What sweet summer children we were and I was no different. I had no idea it'd get so bad that I'd have to straight up rent one of the flats to be able to keep up my lifestyle. But luckily, it was a seller's market. You wouldn't think that'd be the case during a pandemic, but it suited me just fine. I was inundated with applications for one of the flats. I mean, I got literally hundreds of people applying on that open rent website. Finding the right tenant was a lot more work than I thought it would be. Interviewing all the various applicants was a pain. There was some right weirdos applying for the tenancy, and the more I dawdled over who to choose, the more money I was losing. But then, one morning I wake to an email from a prospective tenant telling me they'd be willing to pay 350 extra in rent every month, but that they'd have to move in by the end of the week. They didn't even want a viewing. They were happy enough to move in based on the photos I post online. 350 quid extra was... 50% over the odds and way too good for an offer for me to turn down when I gave the bloke a ring. They seemed normal enough. It was a pretty much done deal. All I had to do was hand him the keys. But when I actually met the bloke last December to do a masked up sanitizer soak socially distanced key handover, they seemed anything but normal. I'm all for wearing masks and stuff, don't get me wrong. I think we should be doing all we can to defeat this, but... This guy was completely covered from head to toe. Black gator over his face, hat on, hood pulled over, gloves, the works. I had absolutely no idea who I was handing the keys to, really. Just that they identified themselves as Stefan, and the same name as the account that contacted me. He barely spoke, and the whole interaction gave me a bad feeling, so 
I tell him I'll come by in a couple of days to see how he was doing. He'd already paid me two months' rent on top of a security deposit, so I was basically stuck with him for the time being. I was starting to think my desperation for cash was about to get me in a lot of trouble. About a week later, I give Stefan a ring to make sure he's settling in alright. I have to call him like six times before he answers and when he finally does, he seems in no mood to talk, but he still somewhat reluctantly agrees to let me stop by. I start worrying about what sort of state the flat is going to be in, but little did I know that I wouldn't be seeing it at all. He refuses to open the door to me, citing social distancing and stuff, which I understand and respect, but there are ways to conduct a flat inspection without violating the whole six-foot rule. I insist. He refuses. I insist some more. He refuses some more. And by the time it got to him threatening to call the police, any potentially good relationship we might have had goes right out the window. Right when he says that, I whip my mask down to make myself heard more clearly and I catch this horrendous smell in the air, one that's so bad that it actually silences me for a moment. I find myself putting my mask right over my mouth and nose and the argument with Stefan trundles along with him agreeing to send me a video of the flat's current condition. The conversation ends, but I hang around for a minute to try to work out where the horrible smell is coming from. It seemed to permeate the entire corridor like it was almost impossible to work out its exact source, and with it being so intense, nor did I want to. I just prayed it wasn't coming from the apartment I just rented out. As you can imagine, I'm quite annoyed at that point, and as I walk back across the street towards my car, I turn back to have a look at the window of the apartment. Now, my eyes are terrible, but I could suddenly see that this Stefan character had all the curtains closed, but had opted to hang a weird kind of mask in the window. I think it was a paper mache or something, and it must have been really old because it looked all shriveled, with long wiry black hairs framing this pretty creepy looking face. I remember letting out an audible sigh like, Christ almighty, this is going to get so much worse before it gets better. And suddenly the mask just disappears back into the curtains. It wasn't just some creepy old piece of decor, Someone had been wearing it and watching me while they were doing so. Stefan then sends me a video of the flat which looked fine, only there was one corner of the living room that he apparently refused to show me. I pressed him on it. He pretended not to know what I was talking about and I just decided to quit while I was ahead. It took a week before I started getting complaints. Other tenants in the building who must have gotten my number from the management company started calling me up to complain about the noise and the smell coming from flat 20, the one I own. But then after a while, the calls stopped being complaints and started being more like warnings. Warnings about the things they'd heard coming from Stefan's flat and how the smells had gotten considerably worse. But still, Stefan refused any kind of formal flat inspection and he still does even now. I drove past the flat about two weeks ago now, one evening when I was driving home from work. I'd had a late one at the office, so it was about nine at night when I decided to take a little detour to check out the flat. I was met with almost immediate regret. Apparently Stefan only uses red bulbs to light the flat after dark, and I'm staring up at the window like, what's this freak up to now? When I see two people, like, running or jumping around the living room, completely naked by the looks of things. He's obviously not the only one living there now, despite there only being his name on the lease. I suppose this isn't even really a story because it doesn't have an end yet. I've already decided that I'm not going to renew Stefan's lease of the flat and that when his two months are up, I'll ask him to leave or else get the authorities involved. But that's about the only thing I'm certain of right now. I've no idea what he's doing in my bloody property, what's making that bad smell or who the other person is. Things have gotten pretty bad at this point as I knew they would, but I have a really grim gut feeling that they can get infinitely worse and that getting Stefan out of the flat is going to be much more trouble than I ever imagined it would. It's not even worth the money anymore. No amount of money is worth finding out that he's done something truly awful in there. I'll try to keep you guys updated in the future if I'm still in a fit state to do so. 
because only God knows what untold horrors await for me in that flat, and God knows what Stefan will resort to in his efforts to keep me and everyone else from finding out. Wish me luck, guys. Things are definitely about to get weird. <laughs>